Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to do my reading wrap-up for the month of March and a little bit of a TBR for the month of April because what I've decided in thinking about what to say in this wrap-up video, I've spent a lot of time this month talking about my booktube prize reading and I'm not sure how much time I want to spend on it. Again, we'll find out. But I figured the best thing to do would be to kind of balance the two things in one video so I have a little bit of an option to not spend so much time on them if I don't want to. We'll see how it goes. I don't know. Sometimes when I get talking, I talk a lot. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. So I finished six books in the month of March. Five of them were for the Book 2 Prize. Let's get to the first one that I finished. I actually listened to it on audio. It is Just As I Am by Cicely Tyson. Now, I enjoyed this book, but I do think it fell into that trap that I frequently find with celebrity memoirs that, that I didn't really like. It felt like it was sort of spinning and projecting, and I think she is can be very critical of herself, but it did feel like at certain points she was trying to position things, and I didn't quite respond to that. I think she is still a great figure. One of the most notable things about her is that she refused to play parts in movies that were derogatory or potentially degrading toward black people. And she came to that decision when she was doing press for Sounder. And she talks about that in the opening chapter of this book, how she was doing press and interviewers would say things to her like, wow, I can't believe the boy in the family in Sounder calls his father dad. It just never occurred to me that a black kid would do that to his father. And she would be sitting there like, what? <laughs> and somebody else would tell her, oh, it's amazing that there's such a loving relationship in this black family. You just, I wouldn't have even thought that would be a thing. And of course she's sitting there and she has to be polite, but she's thinking, why would that not be a thing? So it taught her why it was so important to have positive representation. And of course that was heading into a time when black exploitation movies were very popular in Hollywood. She talks about those as well. And those parts of the book, her involvement in like civil rights or interest in civil rights is really interesting. It's particularly later on in her career that things start to get a little bit of that sort of spin and sheen that it feels like she's projecting an image more so than talking about anything that's true or real or raw. And there's a whole relationship with her daughter that gets glossed over. She says that it's to respect her daughter's privacy, but it also kind of feels like a cop-out because she never explains. She mentions being friends with Bill Cosby, but never mentions anything about what ultimately happens to Bill Cosby. And she does do things like that in other parts of the book. For instance, she is sexually harassed by a teacher when early on in her acting career. And she takes the time to mention that later on he was accused as part of the Me Too movement and had to pay out a bunch of settlements. But because Bill Cosby was her family friend, she doesn't do that, and it just feels bizarre. So I enjoyed this book, but I definitely had some quibbles with it, and the more I get away from it, the more those things that I kind of have problems with are the ones that are lingering in my mind, which is kind of a shame, because I think she's an admirable person, and I did enjoy much of this book. Now we get into the booktube prize titles. I read Death in Her Hands by Otessa Moshfeg and no. I am not a fan of Otessa Moshfeg and I knew that going into the booktube prize and reading Death in Her Hands really just reinforced that for me. I did not like it and I won't get into the spoiler for why. By the way, I talk at length about all of the books I read, including some spoilers, in a different video. I will link it down below. If you want more about them, you can go there and find out a whole lot more. So there's a specific thing that I could tell in the first 15 pages that Otessa Moshfeg was building to, and it's gross. It's very gross. I also read Utopia Avenue by David Mitchell. It's been... I think two weeks since I finished it and it's already starting to fade from my memory and I think that's really only going to get worse as time goes on. I mentioned in the video that's going to be linked down below that it feels like David Mitchell is trying to create this Marvel cinematic universe with his books and that's 
probably a good thing if you follow along with his career and with his books. I don't. I have previously read half of The Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zoot, and that's it. That was my only exposure to David Mitchell before this book. So it felt like there were a lot of references that were just sailing right over my head. And that's not always a fun thing. It's like jumping into the fourth or fifth Marvel movie in a series and you're like, wait, who is that? What's this joke they're making? I don't know. So it would be a better book without those elements, but also without those elements, it really wouldn't be much of a story at all outside of this a standard thing. I don't know. I didn't enjoy it too much. Let's leave it at that and go to the next one, which is actually the second book I finished in March. I'm totally out of order on this. It's Real Life by Brandon Taylor. This was something that was one of my most anticipated reads of 2020, and I am grateful that the Book 2 Prize encouraged me to finally get around to reading it. I really enjoyed it. Again, I will go into this book at greater length in the video that is linked down below, but I was a big fan of it. I think there are smaller quibbles that I have with it, but by and large, it is really astonishing how well Brandon Taylor puts you in the shoes of this character who experiences racism, both casual and overt, and the depression that he feels as a result of childhood trauma and things like that. It's eye-opening and enlightening, and I think a lot of people really dislike this book, and I think part of that is that it's difficult to read about somebody making a lot of bad decisions. And Wallace, the protagonist in this book, makes some bad decisions and does some things that don't quite make sense unless you really give in to the extreme depression and loneliness that he is feeling. And it's just really interesting. So I enjoyed this. And I can't wait for Brandon Taylor's next book, which I believe is coming out later this year. In fact, I probably have it right here. Okay, Filthy Animals by Brandon Taylor is coming out June 22nd. That is a story collection, and I'm really excited about it. It is one of my most anticipated reads of 2021. So he's made the list two years in a row. Hopefully, I'll be getting to Filthy Animals this year and not in 2022, at a year late like I did with Real Life. There's another book I read in the interim, but let's jump to Luster by Raven Leilani, because... This is sort of like a spiritual twin in my mind to real life, except the flaws with this book are greater. The plotting is very contrived. I go on at length about that in the video that's linked down below. But basically, the plot of this book needs Edie, the protagonist, to end up living in the home of Eric, the married man she is in a relationship with. His wife had agreed to an open relationship. So it, the contrivances that get her into that house don't quite make sense. At one point, she is making deliveries for a delivery app, and there is a delivery for a bone saw and a cup of soup, and it turns out she is delivering it to the wife of the man she is having this relationship with. And I, I don't mention this too much in my uh, Book 2 Prize wrap-up, but at that point... The wife invites her into the autopsy that she's performing. That's why she needs a bone saw. But still, it's like wild that the hospital doesn't have a bone saw or a way of ordering it. Anyway, she invites her into the autopsy, which does not make sense. Like, why is this woman going to try to get fired just to be friendly to her husband's side piece? I don't know. And then later in the book, this is the part I didn't mention in it, she invites her back many times to be in the room while she performs autopsies. And it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> but I keep going on about the bad parts of this book. But there are serious flaws. But I think, like real life, it does a really great job putting you in Edie's head. And letting you experience what it's like to feel this racism. And the judgment that people have for her. And it's really interesting. The things that this book gets right, it does really well. And the problems are just all the more confounding. I think that's why I keep harping on them when I talk about this, because I wanted it to be better because of the good things that it does. And that's Luster by Raven Leilani. I also read American Dirt by Janine Cummins. And this one, when I read it, I, I feel like I was trying very hard to say, you know what, it's fine. It was just marketed badly. And it was marketed very badly. And a lot of that does come to Janine Cummins herself. I mean, the fact, and you can see that, like a tattoo on the front of the book, a grapes of wrath for our time, says Don Winslow. And that is a terrible quote for this book. Very off the mark. It's a fine book. It's just, 
it's an action adventure slash thriller book, but it was presented as this literary accomplishment and landmark. And an another book we'll be talking about in a little bit, Infinite Country, but Patricia Engel does everything this book is supposed to be doing so much better. It's just mind boggling. It takes the worst possible approach or the, it gives you the worst possible situation or scenario or outcome in any given moment. And it feels like it lacks empathy for the characters. There's also a really contrived situation, again, where the protagonist of the book, Lydia, has this quasi-romantic relationship with the leader of the drug cartel that murders her husband and sends her on the run, and he's actively trying to kill her. And this backstory feels like it's trying to make the story personal, but it just felt off and weird to me. Like, why is this happening? So, not a very big fan. And the final book I read in the month of March, just managed to squeak it in right before my rankings were due for the book to prize, was The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel, completing the Thomas Cromwell saga or trilogy, whatever you want to call it, that Hilary Mantel has been on. And I really loved this book. I did miss the focused energy of Bring Up the Bodies, which is about a very specific moment in Thomas Cromwell's life. Wolf Hall opens the trilogy, and it is a very long detailed story about his childhood, his adolescence, all the ways he works his way into the court of Henry VIII. Everything that comes later pays off all that time and effort, but I do wish we still had that really focused energy from bringing up the bodies in this book. However, everything that's in here is delicious, and I really liked it. It was my top ranking. So if I may quickly run through my rankings for the book to prize, Mirror in the Light was number one, Real Life was number two, Luster was number three, Utopia Avenue was fourth, American Dirt was fifth, and Otessa Moshfag is just a steaming old pile <laughs> at the bottom. I apologize if anybody likes Otessa Moshfag, that is your right. I'm not a fan. Sorry. That concludes the stuff that I read in the month of March. I would like to quickly mention a TV show, It's a Sin. I mentioned it earlier in the month, maybe even at the end of February. It's on HBO Max. It's a fantastic show. I loved it. I cried. <laughs> it's very good. So I'd recommend checking that out. Again, it's called It's a Sin. It's about a group of young men and their female friend living in London, starting in the early 1980s, stretching into the early 1990s. And it's about the AIDS epidemic and how it impacts their lives. It is very good, very sad, very infuriating at times. So I'd recommend that. Since I finished the book two prize over the past weekend, I didn't really pick anything else up over the weekend. I did get back to something, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I didn't start a new audiobook after finishing The Mirror and the Light. I started binging a podcast that I like called You're Wrong About. And it's been like great comfort food after a month of really trying and stressing to get my book two prize reading done. And they have a series about OJ, they have a series about the DC Sniper that I've gotten into, and both of them are fascinating. And actually, the episodes about OJ are making me want to rewatch the Ryan Murphy TV show, and I'm not a huge Ryan Murphy fan, or to rewatch that docuseries, uh, OJ Made in America, which was really well done. It's got me even curious about reading Jeffrey Tubin's book, The Run of His Life, <laughs> which is about the OJ trial. Jeffrey Tubin is an interesting character these days, to say the least. And it's funny how 25 years later, I feel like there's so much to say about it and there's so many interesting things. I'm sure there were interesting things to say back then, but I was in junior high, I think, when the OJ trial was going on. So I was not paying attention to it at all. I mean, there was no way not to pay attention to it, but I certainly wasn't following it very closely. It's just that it was everywhere, so you couldn't avoid it. But anyway, it's, it's really interesting, and I've been listening to that and enjoying it. So looking forward into April, let's talk a little bit about some of my plans. Now, I mentioned that my goal for this year, in as much as I have one, because I don't really have a reading goal, I wanted to get back to mood reading, and I did not want to read more than one book at a time. I might break that a little bit in April. I managed to get away a little bit with it in March because I finished these book two prize books one at a time. But I think in order to bounce back from that, I might break it a little bit. So I'm supposed to read one book and one audiobook at a time. I might break that a little bit. Let's talk about it. So I had started the final revival of Opal and Nev and had to put it to the side in order to finish my book two prize reading. I'm almost done with it. 
this is the one that I did pick up after I finished my book two prize reading, but I didn't finish it before the end of the month. And I want to finish it, so I'm going to get through that last tiny little part that I have left. That's part of the plan. And I had also started the audio of Infinite Country before I pivoted in my book two prize reading plan because I had started this on audio. It's really short, but two things happened. One, I wanted to pivot to getting some audios in so I could finish my book two prize reading. And two, I really liked the writing enough that I want to pivot to the book. And it's only small. It is not even 200 pages. So I think I can easily fit this in, in April. But again, I'm going to be breaking my rule. Still, I think it will be a worthwhile endeavor. And the reason I would be reading those at the same time as another book is that I have a buddy read planned with Sean the Book Maniac, The Yield by Tara June Winch. And I'm really excited about this. We're going to do a slow buddy read of this. I think we're going to stretch it out across four weeks. I can't remember the schedule, but I th believe that's the plan. And because we're taking a slow approach, I feel like it might be doable to try to get to these in the interim. We'll see how it goes, because the last thing I want to do is try to stress myself out and start that bad habit of reading a lot of different things at a time, because that's not how I like to read. The reason we are doing a buddy read of The Yield this month is that it's Aussie April. It's as simple as that, and Tara June Winch is an Australian author. This book really heavily deals with Indigenous culture in Australia, which I know about in a broad sense, but don't know a whole lot about specifically, so it will be really interesting to learn more about that. This was on the shortlist for the Stella Prize last year, and I think it won the Miles Franklin Award. Both of those are Australian literary prizes, as you can imagine. So what is it about? The Yield is divided into three different narratives. I believe, but the description of the book only seems to cover one, so it's going to be interesting to see how that works once we get into it. The premise is that August Gondawindi returns to her rural Australian hometown for the memorial of her grandfather. There, she finds that the home where her family has lived for decades is on the verge of being repossessed and destroyed by a mining company. In an effort to stop this from happening, August has to find a book her grandfather was writing before he died. And it really gets into indigenous birthrights, treatment of the land. I saw a quote that pointed out that the yield is what you get from the earth, but cross-referenced that with where yield is what you give back. And I think that's interesting. I wish I had the quote in front of me right now, but I think that's going to have really interesting layers as we get into this book. I'm really looking forward to it. I've had a, I've heard a lot of really great things about it, so I'm really excited about this. And it's been a while since I did a buddy read with Sean, so I'm excited for that as well. Once I start getting back into audiobooks, because right now I'm really enjoying the sort of refreshment of listening to a podcast, I plan to do Nomadland by Jessica Bruder because I really enjoyed the movie. It's what I hope wins the Oscar for Best Picture. It's what I think will win the Oscar for Best Picture. And my husband read the book and enjoyed it. And it's very interesting because the book goes in really hard about Amazon and the way its warehouses are run and the ways in which they prey on this nomadic community. And as someone who is pretty staunchly anti-Amazon, I'm looking forward to reading about that. I anticipate that it will make me mad. But I just really enjoyed the movie. And I think it would be interesting to do a movie versus book comparison of a nonfiction story where the narrative was created for the movie because the character Frances McDormand plays is a fictional way of weaving you through the story of the book. And I think that could be interesting. Really looking forward to that. Hopefully the audio will be available on Scribd because I've been having some problems with that. If you follow along, you are aware. And other things coming up, I had forgotten that I had a library hold on a book called The Abstainer by Ian McGuire. This book really jumped out to me because I am a huge fan of Ian McGuire's previous book, which is called The North Water. I don't know that I've talked about this book on my channel before. I read it before I had one, and I really like it. It's got a blurb from Hilary Mantel, What More Do You Need? And I believe it was adapted into a movie, but maybe a TV movie, one that never really got much of a release in the United States, which is a shame because I feel like this would lend itself to a movie 
really well. Anyway, in case you can't tell, I'm a big fan of this book, and I'm a little surprised that given the reception to this one, it was also one of the New York Times' top 10 books of the year in which it was released, I'm surprised that his follow-up book seemed to fly under the radar. I had no idea that it was out until I found out by accident, which is interesting. <laughs> So I got this from the library, and I'm going to have to try to fit it in at some point in April. And I don't know how I'm going to do that. It's probably going to involve breaking my rule again and trying to read two things at once. But we're going to see how this goes. And honestly, if I have to return it to the library and get it at a later date, I might just do that. But what is it about? This follows an Irish veteran of the Civil War in the United States who arrives in Manchester in England in 1867, intending to end British rule in Ireland by any means necessary. This puts him in the path of James O'Connor, who left Dublin for Manchester in order to start over without the grief and the drink that have plagued him back where he had been living. I believe he is a police officer or something like that. Caught between these two men is O'Connor's long-lost nephew. It promises to be a bloody hefty read about Ireland's underground war for independence, which is something that I could stand to learn a little bit more about, so I'm looking forward to this as well. This one I am fully anticipating is not going to happen in the month of April, but I want to talk about it here anyway. It's Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. So far, I've only read one book from my Pulitzer Prize project, and that is A Sad State of Affairs. And I had selected this one to be my second one because the first one was Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. And I feel like there's a really interesting contrast between Larry McMurtry and Margaret Mitchell and what he was trying to do with Lonesome Dove and what she is trying to do with Gone with the Wind. I think it would be really interesting to be the follow-up to Lonesome Dove. Basically, Larry McMurtry grew up in Texas in a time when people from the Old West were still alive and would tell him stories, and he was fascinated by them. But as he grew up, he became critical and interrogated the myths of the Old West. And Lonesome Dove is meant to kind of undermine those and poke holes in them and make you question what the great American myth about its own creation is. Margaret Mitchell grew up in the South after the Civil War was over. So she grew up hearing stories about the Old South and how great it was and how it had been ruined by the Civil War. But instead of growing up to interrogate the stories that she had been told, she grew up and perpetuated them. And that comes out in Gone with the Wind, which is a story about the Old South being Gone with the Wind. So she's not criticizing, she's not undermining, she's not asking the reader to question, she's asking them to mourn what has been lost. And I think that's a really interesting contrast and something that would make a good conversation to follow up on the one I had about Lonesome Dove. Again, I don't think this is going to happen in the month of April. This is much more likely to happen in the month of May. I'm just putting it on my own radar by talking about it here. You don't actually have to think about this too much. You don't have to remind me. <laughs> Reminders might actually be annoying now that I'm thinking about it. But I'm putting it on my own radar by mentioning it here and reminding myself that this is something that I really, really want to get to at some point soon. So I would love to hear what you've had going on in the month of March, what you've read, what you've loved, what you've hated, what you've watched, any of it. Put it in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.